Hi everyone, uh, before we start, just a warning. Uh, I'm now connected, not by a cable, but by uh, the Wi-Fi to the tablet. So it's likely that it might um, crash now and then. It has happened in the past. So if this happens, just let me know. I need to do this while it's charging and I can swap back. We'll wait a minute. Okay, we can start. So, hi, welcome back. Uh, welcome to lecture 25. And today, what we'll do is we'll continue on this idea of modeling uncertainty for now about states and uh, the idea of local uncertainty. So we'll go back to the scenario that you we saw at the end of the last lecture and you saw today in the tutorial where you have two players and you want to know how it's involved, they might be separated, scientists. Uh, and, and we want to, to model just mm -hmm. Alice's information about the global state. So we will, we will repeat some of the calculations we did at the end of the last lecture. I was a bit rushing um, and there were some questions, so we'll repeat this. And then we'll see like what Alice knows about uh, evolutions in a special case. And uh, as a bonus, I still had to upload this missing lecture from when I was sick. So I'll do this today. Uh, later, in case you want to watch live, of course, you don't have to. You can always watch it later on YouTube. Um, it will be like, we will kind of fill the gaps of two things that belong to previous chapters. So one, one of them will be when we study the stationary states in 1D, we're going to look at the case of a finite box. So it goes like this. Um, and the other one is more related to spin. Uh, it's the harmonic oscillator, so it, it's a special type. It's a special type of Hamiltonian that we see. We can relate to a lot of things used in spin. It's very nice. It's very useful. So, in terms of viewing order, um, this is go, I'm going to call it lecture twenty six. But you don't need it to follow the the lectures until the end of the semester. So you can watch it just at the end. But um, yeah, I wouldn't watch it much earlier than this lecture that we're at now. Okay, so that's uh, the idea. So where were we last time? I think the lecture notes for today are on Moodle already. So we talked about uncertainty of about the a quantum state, right? We, we saw the scenario that if all I know is that with probability, um, pi, I get state psi i, that I can model, uh, which is in some Hilbert space, I can model uh, my information through this object, which is a matrix, or in continuous systems, just a... Uh, the chat is covering some of the screen on the right side. Ah, yes, so I should not write on the right side. Yeah, let me see. Uh, yeah, I should just not write. Oh, no, it's very strange. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Yeah. Let me see what's happening. What? I need to put this in first place and then maybe minimize this, put it somewhere rubbish and put the chat up here. Why would Zoom do this? Okay, I'll hide the chat so I just see if you write something. Is it better like this? Uh, Jonathan, can you? Yes, okay, so we continue like this then. All right. <laughs> no worries. Technology. Uh, okay, so we saw that we can model this in the discrete case if if it well if it's a finite probability distribution with finite uh, number of these i's, we can write it like this: pi uh, pi. And this is a matrix, right? Um, which formally means it's a an endomorphism. It means a linear map essentially from the system to itself. 
And it has some properties, which you proved in the lecture, in the tutorial now, which is that the trace is one, because it corresponds, in the case where these states are orthogonal, it corresponds to summing up these probabilities. And we can always decompose a density matrix like this. And um, sorry, all the eigenvalues are larger or equal to zero, because again, it corresponds to a probability uh, distribution, right? <laughs> So even if these states are not orthogonal, maybe I know that probability one half gives me state zero, probability one half gives me state plus, they're not orthogonal, but one can always find a decomposition like this with different numbers here in different states there. So spectral decomposition. Okay. And the other thing we saw is that they evolve, if there's some unitary U, then it evolves like rho to U rho U dagger which makes sense because it's again, with probability PI, what I should get is the evolved version of, of the state psi i, right? And the complex conjugate. Okay. And then we looked at this special case, which is then we have just local information. So when this um, lack of information about what state I have comes from uh, just having access to locality. So I have Roy B. And then I ask, well, what does an agent here, Alice, know about this, about the global state if she only has access to Hilbert system, to the Hilbert space HA? So and in particular, she can do something like she can perform measurement and we should get here the right measurement statistics so the idea is to find a map that characterizes the local information that alice has so it should be a map from the space of density matrices globally to the space of density matrices local, locally. So from some rho b, it should return something that is still a density matrix. And what should it satisfy? Well, first it should satisfy that for measurements, if Alice makes a measurement described by projectors, for example, pk on A, and we saw this can be seen as nothing happening on Bob's side. Right, then the probability of getting K for this global state rho. Well, we know that this is trace of pi i identity and b, but we want this, uh, sorry, rho up times rho a b. And we want this to be written in this more compact form like this, right? So this was the thing we were proving last time. Uh, and the other thing that we care about is that uh, if now Alice evolves the state here, she applies some, some physical evolution to the state just on her Hilbert space, that she can also work directly with this state row A and just evolve this without caring about the global space, uh, global state. So. We'll come back to this in a moment. So let me just recap uh, what we did last time because I needed some clarification there. Okay, so I'll just recap what we did last time. So we take the special case and you just trust me that this works in general, or if you don't trust me, you can prove it yourself that this works in general for projectors. On Alice's side. So this is a special case of where we're measuring just in a basis. <laughs> um, in general, if you have a projector, it can always be some, it can be some sum of some okay, this the sum of projectors into individual states. Oh now I wrote it here, which you cannot see because it's in the corner. 
For projectors, you can you can write it like this, so that the, if it's projected not just into one but one and zero, then you can write it like this for some subset of the total basis. So you can you can repeat this calculation for that case and see that it still works. Okay, but as I was saying, so let's just recap what we did. So the probability of getting k, what is rho? It was as we said. So the trace of B A K times identity on B. And now here the row A B. And the trace. So note that if uh, I if this is a basis for the first space H A and this is a basis for the second space H B, then I A J B is a basis for the for the global space, right? This is important to recap. And okay, H B. Okay, so continue like this. The trace means that we sum over basis elements, so we're going to sum over basis elements of this form J, and then we have here I J. A and B. Now comes my projector, which I know what it is. Uh, it is KK on A and nothing happening in B. Now comes my Roy B, which it could be anything for now. And there comes here the, again, the I and J, right? Okay, so I have this and then We simplify this by saying, well, the first, this is the way the tensor product works. So we have first I acting on the K. K, C A, tensor is the J acting on the second. Here comes my Roy B. And now the, the rest is the same. Okay, but this, of course, I mean, we could do this with any basis, but let's make our life simple. We just choose the same basis. Okay, so we have, we saw, you saw in the tutorial that the trace is basis independent. So we could choose any basis here for, for the first subsystem. So we just choose the same basis uh, of which this is one of the elements, which means that this inner product here uh, is a delta function or the Kronecker delta, if it's, if it's a discrete case. Okay. Then the next thing we did is, okay, so then this gets rid of one of the, of the sums. B, taka taka, Rui B. And now I can only be K, so there's K I here, and uh, J in B, right? And then the next thing we said was, well, uh, you know, if I have A tensor B, this is the same as having A tensor identity, identity tensor B. And we use this to take the, the sum over A to the outside, right? So then we did this being KA identity in B, J, of identity in A, J, B, Roy, B, uh, so identity in A, J, and B. Okay, now we have here, K, A, identity in B. Okay. So this is the thing that we care about. Let me bring it to the next state because now comes the part that I kind of uh, rushed last time. Okay. So we have this whole thing. And I said, I told it, well, this thing, 
is what we call row A. This is the trace B of row B. And in fact, this thing here is redundant because this whole thing belongs only on the on system H A. And then I said, well, so then this whole thing is just a number. I mean, it should be a number at the end of the day. We know this because it will look, it's a probability of getting an outcome. But what we didn't do in detail was this part here. Okay, so I'll do it now in a bit more detail. And the key to do this is to say, well, in general, if I have a matrix, I can always expand it in any basis. Okay, as let's say, uh, system A, system B, and prime, sum over L and M, sum over L prime and prime of some coefficients L and this just means I have I have my matrix and I'm just expanding it in this coefficient. So here's alpha one, 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 one. The next one I think is one, two, one, one. If it's only two systems, and so on. And here comes alpha two, two, two. No, one, two, one, two, and so on. I'm just saying this is a matrix. So I'm going to expand it in any basis. What basis? Well, uh, uh, this basis is, is the one I'll care about. <laughs> so I just pick a product basis and I have like this and maybe a nicer, well, a more useful way to, to formulate this thing here is to put together the systems of the same system together. So I just write L, L prime A, tensor, uh, no, M, M prime on B. Okay. I did not change anything. I just expanded it like this. So then, uh, so then we care about whoop, this object here. So now this thing is just, let's say the sum over J, sum over L, L prime, uh, yeah, M, M prime, doesn't matter the order of the sums. And now I have here identity on A tensor JB. And now I have this alphas, L, M, L prime, M prime. And I have here L, L prime on A, tensor M prime on B. And I've got again here the identity on A, tensor, uh, the J's on B stretch. Okay, so now this, becomes again very easy. This is the thing with quantum mechanics, right? We have very complicated formulas and then half of the terms cancel out and we're happy. So on the first system, you just have the identity from one side and the identity from the other side, so nothing happens, right? So then you have identity on A, L, L prime, identity on A, and then the second system, we have this J M and then the M prime J inner products. And this is Delta J M and this is Delta J M prime. So then overall, what we get is that we get rid of the sums over uh, M and M prime because they disappear. And then we just have here alpha L J L prime. J, L, L prime, 
Because now uh, these things here are numbers, so this tensor product is not really doing anything. It's just now a tensor product to the complex numbers. Bit. So you can just replace it by the coefficient. Okay, so this is the, the definition of the of the partial trace. And what we do with this now uh, is that now when we go back, okay, and we just sandwich it here, again, this identity on the on this trivial Hilbert space is not doing anything. Yeah, mathematical is rigorously way to the mathematical rigorous way to do this a bit more uh, subtle, but at the end of the day, you'll end up in the same place. So then we get that the probability of uh, outcome k for the state rho is just k rho a k. And this is the last time that we can write this as a trace of k k rho a and this is the trace of the project in k rho a right and the only difference if you have different projectors that have more than one the projector in more than one basis element is that you get here uh, a sum over some case so if you do it by hand that will be the only difference you get okay so uh what did this get us well, this we started with saying that this is the same as a trace of pi k, sorry, um, it's called pi k a, k a, times the identity on b, rho b. Right? So this means the following. So we start with state rho b, and we want to compute the probabilities of a local measurement. Then we have two options. So we want to end up here in the probabilities of getting outcome K if we're measuring only Alice's side, right? Option A is to go directly and say, well, this is a trace of uh, pi A K tensor data in TNB times uh, that the input object, right? This is this just means the input object, so it will be a bit. This is one option. The other option that we saw now is to first take the partial trace over B. So we end up here with row A and then go from here to the trace uh, of pi A K times the input. Okay. That's this option here. You end up with the same probabilities, right? So which one do you do? I mean, it depends on the on the problem and it depends on the shape of this, that one will be easier or the other. But in general, if Alice wants to do lots of things locally, uh, it's gonna always be more, more convenient to take first a partial trace and then just do this local computation. Okay, so what we have right now is that for the purposes of local measurements, Alice only needs to know the reduced state. It's called the reduced state because we trace out uh, meaning we ignore um, Bob's side of this. Yeah. I would just like to make a point here that this partial trace, this is not a physical transformation. It's not something you go and apply in the lab. This is, um, um, it, it's, just, it's just forgetting. It just corresponds to forgetting, to ignoring information, right? It's a kind of information processing task. It's not, um, yeah, it's not something physical. At all, the, the, this whole state is still there. We do not destroy the subsystem B. So now, what about evolutions? So we can have two types of evolutions. So one would be uh, local, and the other one will be global. Uh, local evolutions are the ones of this form that something happens on Alice's side, and something happens on Bob's side. For now. Uh, unitary evolutions, right? So we have the whole state, and then something happens here, and something happens there. <laughs> and then you get some new state there. Okay. Uh, but then you can also have global evolutions, which is some 
UAB that cannot be described in this form. And this is the case, for example, of interactions when we talked about um, coupling two systems together, for example, uh, to make a measurement, right? The measurement device pointer and the system to be measured. So there are many, many uh, global interactions, but now we'll first look at this case here. And again, you can think of this. I have, I have this joint state Roy B. I sent, I gave part to Alice, Bob kept the other part, and then Alice does something locally here. Bob does something locally there. Um, and what does Alice know about the final stage? That's the question. Okay, so we look first at local evolutions, and then next time we'll see, we'll look at global evolutions. So then we ask, okay, what is, what is Alice's information about the state UA of the evolved state, right? So we evolve the global state is a mixed state, it's a density matrix in general, so we can evolve it like this. And at the end of the day, we're gonna do the partial trace to know what Alice knows about the evolved state. Okay, so then we just do this. So sum over J of this identity in A, J in B, and now this whole thing again, and then again we'll come identity in A, B. Okay, so we have this. And we just do the usual tricks. So first we say that, well, this J um, acts only in the second system. So what we have is the identity in the first UA tensor is J B B Roy B. And now we have here. UA dagger, identity on A, tensor BB, dagger, sorry, JB. Yep. So we have this. And now we're gonna apply this, the same thing as we did before, just saying, well, then I can take uh, this thing out of the sum. So it's just gonna be um, UA tensor identity in B, and we'll see that this identity is redundant. And then we have here in the middle, J of A, J, B, B, oh, oh, Roy B, and now again here, identity in A, oh, sorry, V, B, dagger, J, Okay, close the brackets, U, A, dagger, identity, and B. Okay, so first of all, you can already see that this state here, this is gonna belong just on the first subsystem, meaning that this identities are gonna be redundant. And that's because, well, you have here this, this uh, bras and cats that are kind of what is called contracting. Yeah. Um, and the claim is that this is again, this, so then if this was true, then the whole thing would be just UA, rho A, UA dagger. So now we need to prove this thing. Okay. So how do we do this? And it's again, the same freedom as we had before. So we, we can choose any basis for, for this system B. This J's could be anything. So we go and choose one that um, makes our life easier. So we pick J's to be, well,
So the idea is VB is a unitary, right? What do unitaries do? They change bases, right? We saw, for example, that the Hadamard changes from zero one to plus minus bases. In general, all the, um, yeah, any unitary can be seen as a change of bases. So this changes bases. And in this, we do, you might not know what it is if you don't know what this unitary is, but you know that this must also form a basis. Right, because it's a unitary, it, it maps orthogonal states to orthogonal states, it preserves all the inner product. So this is a basis okay. of the second subsystem. So then we just replace this here. So you get JA identity in A. So we have the ket, uh, we have the bra. The bra means it's, it's going to be this J tilde. Oop. J tilde. Because it's the bra is the Nisvi um, dagger and BB. Right, row AB. And now again here, identity in A, tensor, VB dagger, and I would just replace here with VB, J tilde in B. But because VB is a unitary, this is just the identity, right? That's the definition of unitary. And this is just the identity, right? So then overall, what we have is again, exactly the definition of the partial trace that we saw before, right? So we have the sum over J identity in A times a basis element. Maybe it's a different basis that we started with, but it doesn't matter. And then here, identity in A. Okay. So this is exactly the, the partial trace again which means we prove the claim. So then, um, so Alice's information about the evolved state is just this, it's, it's as if she had started with row A and that just evolved it with her local uh, operation. So let me just write the diagram again. So if we start with row B, right? And now there are these local evolutions on both sides. And so we have this, uh, well, I'll just write here what the total evolution is. <laughs> so you end up here with this UA, UB, Roy B, UA dagger, uh, B, UB dagger. Okay. And then you Take the partial trace, meaning ignore Bob's side so that we have only access to Alice's information. Then we saw that this is just UA or A, UA dagger. Okay. Which means we could also have gone the other way around, which is to first we take the partial trace, so we obtain for A, and then we ignore everything that's happening on Bob's side and do just the evolution with UA. So, there are now these two, um, these two ways to go around. And now you ask, oh, which, one, which one will you do? I mean, now most of the cases, it's always more convenient for Alice, especially if she doesn't know what Bob is doing on, on his side, to always go this way. First take the partial trace and then, um, and then involve it uh, with the evolution she knows she applied. <laughs> if now we combine it with the previous diagram, so now, so now uh, what we have is, we have this row B, right? Alice evolved it, Bob evolved it. And now um, Alice makes a measurement, right? And Bob, well, for now, let's say it does nothing, but it won't matter what he does. And we want to know here the probabilities for the new state. Well, then again, 
we had these two options, right? Which was to go from here and to do the trace of Alice's measurement. of this new state, let's call it row AB prime. So she can do this. And then we end up here with this probabilities of K for this new state for prime, or she can do it directly here. Right. Okay. Uh, and I mean, this, this way is always gonna be computationally easier to do it. So what are some, some very important consequences of this? So first of all, we have now non-signaling between Alice and Bob, meaning that uh, Alice cannot detect anything that Bob does here, right? So even if she, does whatever operation she wants on her side and then makes a measurement, these probabilities uh, will never depend on what Bob did. Uh, and this is one way to, to define non-signaling, right? It doesn't matter what Bob can do there, Alice can never detect it. Uh, the other thing is that we saw that the partial trace is also basis independent like the trace because it doesn't matter what I put here. Good. Uh, the other thing is that we, it gives Alice a way to compress information. Alice and whatever experiments, uh, exper in many experimental settings, we only need to keep track of local information, right? If later on, all we want to do is local evolutions and local measurements, we only need to keep track uh, of the reduced state on Alice's side, not the global state. Now, um, that, that's kind of the extent of it because it's important to know, and you saw in some in some examples in the tutorial that attention you what you cannot do is just take um, oh I take the local state in Alice's side, I take the local state in Bob's side, and now I combine them. Uh, this is not the same as my original state uh, because this will ignore the correlations between the two. So let me give you a classical example. So the classical example is I flip a coin. I'm going to do this experiment many times. I flip a coin. Um, if heads is up, then um, between the two assistants, Lydia wins and Nuria loses. If tails is up, uh, Nuria wins and Lydia loses, okay? I do this many, many times. So what is the, what is the local state of, of Nuria, for example, is that she wins half of the time and she loses half of the time, right? What's the local state of, uh, of Lydia? It's the same. She wins half of the time, she loses half of the time, right? So if they wanted to describe like the probability of winning next time, it would be just one half. Now, if I, if they just use this local information, right? And they give it to you. And so, so they tell you, look, Lydia wins half the time or she gets outcome one half the time and Nuri gets outcome one half the time and they get outcome zero half the time, each of them, right? Then you could think, okay, so then there's four options. If you don't know what the global game is, right? You don't have access to this global information, just a local one. You say, well, there's four options then. Either Lydia wins and Nuria loses, or Nuria loses and Lydia wins, or they both lose, or they both win, right? You can always combine this local information in, in all these ways. And that's the equivalent of doing this. We can even model it as quantum states. Um, but in fact, if you know the global information, if you know the game, then you know that they're actually correlated. These things can never happen. They can never always win or always lose. There's only these two options. Um, um, Lydia wins and Nuria loses or the other way around. <laughs> so this is a concept that is already present in, um, 
in classical information theory and everyday life. And we just have to be very careful uh, here because we see for many purposes, it's very convenient to take the, the local state, you know, now I only have to care about the matrix that's half the size, it's great. For all the local operations, that's all I care about. But know that if I do this, then I'm losing information about correlations with Bob. So I cannot just then recombine the local information with nothing else and recover the global state. We need, we need information about correlations as well. So I wrote an example. And the whole calculation is in the in this lecture notes, so you can look at it <coughs> carefully. So now, I'll, because we don't have so much time, I'll just give you the results. So example is the maximally entangled state. So also called Bell state, we've seen it a few times. So we have AB is, Zero, 0, plus 1, 1. So we have two qubits, one for Alice, one and Bob, and they are entangled in this state. So then what's the Roy B? It's a pure state. Okay, so there's only one probability, it's the probability of getting this. So it's five, five. And this is gonna be what? So I have uh, zero, 0, plus 1, 1. Zero, 0 plus one, one, square root two, square root two, there's four terms here, which are zero, 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 plus zero, zero, one, one, plus one, one, zero, zero, plus one, 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 one. Go over two. And this corresponds to the matrix uh, that looks like this. So it has a one here, this is zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. One one is the last one, so it has one here. Everything else is zeros, but then it has another one there and there, right? Because it's zero, zero. So. And everything else is zeros. <laughs> now, if you take the partial trace here, and again, the whole calculation is there. Oh, sorry, over two times. Uh, if you do the, the calculation for the reduced states, which I asked in the tutorial, and I have all the steps here, so A trace B over A B, this turns out to be a fully mixed state. A, A over two, this is one half of the identity on A, so it's one half of one, one. And one trick to do uh, quick uh, partial traces, if you have like this, is that the first term of the matrix is gonna be the sum of this diagonal, and then you get the sum of this. You, you kind of split the matrix into four and you sum all the diagonals to get uh, the new smaller matrix. If you want, I can go into more detail like this. Okay. The row B, which is trace over A of row B, is again, it, it's going to be exactly the same, one over two, and it's and B. Yeah. So these are fully mixed states, and this is a general thing. Like you can have a pure state, but if it has correlations between the two systems, either classical, no, classical is going to be, if it's entangled, then locally it's always going to be a mixed state. If it has classical correlations, it's a mixed state. Anyway. Okay, so we have this. And now what is uh, row A tensor row B in this case? So say now we only have the local information, we combine it. Well, then this is gonna be one half of identity on A, tensor one half of identity in B. And this is one fourth of the global identity. So this is again a fully mixed state, which looks like this. So it's a very different state than the state uh, rho B that we started with, right? And the difference is if you, if you only have this, then you don't know, for example, that if they make a measurement in the Z basis, 
if you have just a global state, you know that if they make a measurement in the Z basis, either they both get zero or they both get one, right? They cannot get zero and one. Like before we cannot have, um, well, before we couldn't have like uh, Lydia winning and Nuria winning. It's, there's some things that are forbidden, but if you only consider the local information, right? Then you think you've made the wrong predictions. You'd say, well, yes, actually they can. There is a possibility one fourth that they get zero one and the possibility probability one fourth that they get one zero and one fourth they get one one and one fourth they get zero zero. So you'd really make the wrong predictions. In this, uh, I'll finish here, but then I would just leave you with the notion that then density matrix are always subjective to an observer. So you can have an observer that is has access to the global information, right? And then it would represent the setting with, the, with this state, which is a pure state. Then you could have the observer Alice that only access, maybe she doesn't know the global state, she only has access to her local state, she can do measurements there in her subsystem, then she would describe it like this. And Bob, the same thing, would describe it just as this, right? And then you have even a third observer that can just, can just have access to the local information of Alice and local information of Bob. And then this person described the global state like this, right? which is not, um, it's not an accurate representation of the, of the setting. Okay, so I'll leave you with this. Think about it. I uh, think that quantum states are subjective in many ways, and one of them is they're subjective to the information that one has. There are ways to conciliate all this information again, to reconcile it by modeling not just the quantum state, but the quantum state and the memory of the different observers. Okay. And then in many settings, you get like global, state that is compatible with all the with all the local reduced states so maybe i'll put an exercise about this next week uh next week we'll see what happens when you have now an evolution that is not of this form but it's a global evolution and then we'll see in general how we can model uncertainty about uh the evolution not just in this case okay i'm here if you have questions otherwise have a good weekend. See you on Tuesday.